We're getting back on track here with Catherine and Emily, but as you know, we won't stay there for long because this is the Going Off Track podcast. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Going Off Track podcast. I'm Catherine, that's Emily, and we are officially in the second half of the Formula One season. We are officially back. Yes. (laughs) If you missed our From the DMs episode when I returned, um, I'm back. I'm back in the U.S. And we're finally doing our live, not live, but real-time prediction podcast once again. Yes. On American Wi-Fi. There's no more delay. You guys, I don't know if you realize this to everyone who's listening. We would have sometimes like a solid five second delay (laughs) between everything we said. And it was so incredibly hard to podcast. And now I'm back and now we don't have it. So now we can actually have like a real conversation and I don't have to like guess what Catherine's saying. Yeah, no, it's 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 very helpful to like also be talking at someone who's moving and not just like a frozen image of Emily's face while it tries to like keep up and catch up um, or just something like uber pixelated. These, these are the things that, that happen in the background of our podcast. Um, my my but... personal favorite is when like I would be frozen, but I know that you'd still go and I'd have to like awkwardly smile and just keep like nodding my head yeah. so it wouldn't look like I'm panicking. So I I don't remember which one, but there was one that was really, really rough and we were just like, it is what it is. Um, yeah, yeah. We'll have to figure out which one that is so we can reference it more often. But yeah, no, it's great to talk to like a clear Catherine now, so... Yeah, same here. Um, and and speaking of talking, we we have a decent amount of news going in, into this weekend. And let's start with instead of a contract announcement, we have some contract speculation. We do, we do. So there's a lot going on right now around Esti Vesti, Esteban Akon, possibly moving to Haas next year. So lots of rumors there. He would be joining um Behrman. Oh, Behrman, yes. Words. So that means K Mags might be screwed out of a seat. There are still a lot of seats available. We're still waiting for the Carlos Sainz domino to fall to see where everyone else kinds of kind of shakes out. But there has been a lot of noise in the rumor mill around SD Bestie to Haas. Um, I think we're expected to get an announcement either this week, which I feel like it's already too late if it was this week or in Belgium. But I don't know. Catherine, what do you what do you see? coming out of out of this rumor do you, are you pro con and different i you know Akon is clearly a talented driver who has been in a car for a while that is just not very good. Um, and obviously, you know, we have the longstanding discussions of whether he's like a good teammate and blah, blah, blah. But I, I don't I don't hate it. I think Haas could use a little bit of fresher blood, like as much as we love K-Mags for just being, you know, the, the grid's chaos bag at this season. Um, has he really been producing in the way that Haas needs it to in the way that you know Nico Hulkenberg is I'd say the answer is no so it it wouldn't surprise me that they would look elsewhere and especially with Akon being available after his upcoming departure from Alpine it's probably going to be one of you know Haas's best options and I think that he could pair well with an Ollie Behrman type who is very clearly the rookie in the pairing and like very clearly the you know secondary driver in comparison to you know his F1 experience so it could Let's possibly just mean pause that he's on gonna... that. Ollie currently has more, I'm pretty sure has more points than SD Bestie this year and he's been in one race. You you might be right. Let's actually, actually let let's let's let's, let's see about that cuz cuz you you may be right. Um let's see Ollie like, Behrman saying but at the same time Yeah, like no no no, you're cars, totally right. right. Not only that he has twice <laughs> as many points as Akon, but in in the grand scheme of Esteban Ocon's Formula One experience, he has a little bit more than one race bearman. Um, so, so yes, and yes, and and it's still hilarious that he's still P fourteen in the championship. But I, I think that it's you know it's one of Haas's better options, especially with Hulkenberg departing. Yeah, I I see your viewpoint, and you're very you know valid in what you're saying. I just kind of question the team thought process behind it a bit because it has been Esteban Ocon has not always been the best teammate and he's hard to drive with. If you're bringing in a promising rookie, you generally want to have someone to help lead and foster his talent and help him on the track. So I think 
Like, yes, he is. Sorry, I have sirens going over here. I'm currently in downtown Houston. Like, yes, he's a good available driver, but is he going to really help build the team? You know what I mean? I mean, yeah, I, I, but I think you would have that question whether it was him pairing with Behrman or anybody else that, you know, Haas would, would have chosen to, to take on in that, in that second seat. So, you know, the, the, you know, this could be a make or break type of season for Ocon where if he goes to Haas and he's just, you know, it's a disaster, then they kind of know that this, it's not just, it wasn't just a, you know, problem because Alpine had a, a bad car. Um, this, right. this might be an actual driver problem. So it, it could really, you know, expose, you know, more of, more of Ocon's faults, especially if, you know, Haas comes back with a car next year that forgets it, you know, it forgets it knows how to drive on Sundays. Yeah. I don't know. I think I just love K Mags as a person so much. And I think he is an older driver He's very experienced. He's been around for a long time. And I think he's a great teammate. Like, we can see that with how he drives for Hulkenberg. And I think he would probably be a really a safe choice as a teammate for a promising rookie like Ollie. I, I mean, I know I we can all just say it. K-Mac will not have a seat next year on the grid. But I hate to see that because I don't know. I think I don't think his time is up in F1. I think he's just been stuck with a shit car for a very long time. Yeah, yeah, and obviously he's he's going to be a little bit hampered with, you know, 10 penalty points on on his license right now, but I do um I I am a little concerned. I don't think that there would be another place on the grid for Magnuson. Obviously, no. you know, Sauber's second seat is not going to go to him cuz they're not going to take both Haas drivers. The the open Alpine seat is, you know, a real big question whether they're going to go with a reserve driver, whether Carlos Sainz is going to have a concussion and say yes um or, you know, you know where, you know, the, the second seat at Williams would, would be, you know, probably his, his best chance. But I think that there are other drivers that would be in line for that. Yeah, no, it's for him. It's, it's Haas or nothing. So if this does come out, then it's pretty safe to say that K Max will not be returning. So. Yeah, exactly. Which, which is kind of a bummer. Like he's already gotten his second chance at being in formula one. He was, you know, they, they parted ways with Haas when Haas decided to go double rookie. Then they came back when one of those rookies, you know, his, dad's Russian oligarch, whatever, Russia, et cetera. Um, so it, it would be a bummer to, to see him go out like this. But I think that we have seen some really good driving from Magnuson, just not good enough driving. And, and you know, when we're in a, a situation with the grid as talented as it is, good enough is, is not going to, unless you're Lance Stroll, you know, good enough is not going to keep you on the grid. Average doesn't keep you around unless your last name is Stroll. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, well, I, I don't know. You know how I feel about contracts. I just want them out at this point because we've already ruined silly season. But I love talking about them. I'm really interested to see if this does come to fruition. What the terms will be? If it'll be multi year? If it's just if it's two year? If it's one in one? So it'll be really interesting to see how that all shakes out. Yeah, exactly. Especially since a lot of these teams have been so vague lately with their like multi-year deals. Like, what does that mean? Is that three years? It's probably three years. Is it five years? Is it 50 years? How many years is a multi-year deal? And just give us the end date so that our spreadsheets can look pretty. Exactly. Well, speaking of contracts, not really contract, but let's say partnership. Um, yes. It has been announced that Lewis Hamilton is partnering with Dior and I could not be more excited. I love this partnership. I think Lewis just totally fits the bill of that like luxury brand representative. He already has a campaign or had one. I don't know when it ended with Rimois, which is like this super ultra luxe expensive suitcases that look like any other suitcase, but they're yeah. like $1,000. And I think this just really fits him as a brand and, and as a person. And I think it's really, really cool too that he gets to be a guest designer for their lifestyle capsule collection, which will be out uh, later this fall. But I'm so excited to see what he comes up with because we've talked about it this season. The fashion's kind of been like meh, but he is stepping it up now that we're in summer and he has all these cool things to wear. But he's so stylish. I'm jealous of his fashion sense. So I'm super excited to see what comes out of this. 
Yeah, this is really cool. And like you said, the collection is dropping in stores and online on October 17th. So Paul, my dad, when you're listening to this, you are no- going to know what you're going to get for your birthday. Oh, I don't like my dad that much. Oh, and I mean, like, I don't know if I'm really going to spend, you know, buku bucks on some weird Dior stuff that you won't wear. Um, but it's funny to say, because th- that the day that it drops is my dad's birthday. Oh, okay. I get it now. That makes sense. Yes. I was like, I yes. don't like my dad though. <laughs> it's a text message. He doesn't even get a call. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Um, but no, I like, I'm obsessed with seeing these athletes and their brand partnerships. Cause if you think about it, the general, the, the more, I don't want to say layman, but your, your normal sports, right? Football, soccer, hockey, those things. Those athletes are, have like Powerade, Gatorade, Nike, Adidas, Under Armour. Like I wouldn't say they necessarily branch into the luxury style or the luxury brands, but F1 being a, you know, big money sport, it makes sense. And I love this and I'm excited. So. Yeah. And I mean, honestly, I think we're seeing more of a shift. I mean, obviously Hugo Boss was a sponsor of um, Fernando Alonso and I think they were partnered with Aston Martin. Now they're with um, Visa Cash App RB, our favorite friends at yep. Carp. But then you also look at like a professional women's basketball in the United States. You know, I believe Caitlin Clark was the first professional athlete to go to a draft um, wearing Prada. Um, so like they, like women's basketball in the U S they have been really stepping up with like the luxury partnerships and things like that. Um, but it really is more of a more recent thing. Like even for, for a while, like Nike was the top brand that athletes would want to sign with to, to represent. Um, and then Nike has all its little like different offshoots, but now we have, you know, a lot of these actual luxury brands that are partnering with athletes internationally. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the international athletes, especially football slash soccer however Mm -hmm. you choose to call it um especially ones like in europe they will have the the bigger luxury brand deals and stuff like that but i just love brand deals i had a whole class on it in college and it was just so fascinating to understand like everything from a technical perspective so it's always exciting to see new things and i feel like he'll have some really really cool dior stuff for arriving to the track now so yeah. Yes. Tra- track arrivals are are always um are always wanna, fun, or they they should be fun. New, like Prada collab partnership. I I really want more out of Prada fashion from him. He he, he did so, so good last year, and like where like is it the this wrap year? around pants skirt that he wore last year? I was like, this is fashion. Where have you been all of F one's life? Exactly. And I think it was Prada. I want to say it's Prada, but I know that I think he's I think you're right. Before and he's oh, so cool. Anyways, our fashion. Yeah. Fashion also, speaking of the episode. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of track arrivals, I forgot to mention this, but I do want to mention this now before we dive into the rest. But I, I would not surprise me, um, going back to Esteban Ocon and you know a potential announcement at Haas. It would not surprise me if that announcement dropped on Thursday when this episode also goes live, because that's just how things have been for us lately. Where I have, I have been predicting that they are coming out the same day that our episodes do. So. Could to to be said that it could be announced as you are also listening to this episode uh, tomorrow in the future for us, but in the present for you. Um, we speaking can only of, do so much. <laughs> I can I can only be so clairvoyant. Um, but speaking <laughs> of looking into the future and looking into 2028, us has extended its technical partnership with Ferrari until 2028, which is midway through mid ish way through um, the next regulation. This comes to very little surprise because they've been you know, technical partners with Ferrari since the inception of Haas. That's how Haas exists is that they are technical partners with, with Ferrari, which basically means that like things that Ferrari makes that are basically spec, um, alongside the engine, um, they, you know, Haas gets those as well. Um, but on the other hand, Haas is in a little bit of legal hot water, allegedly. So as, as we all remember, um, Haas's, um, title sponsor was your Kali, um, which is a Russian fertilizer company owned by Nikita Mazis owned by Nikita Mazepin's father. Um, When Russia did that oopsie thing in 2023, Haas said, um, thank you, but no thank you. And also the United States said that you have to divest from Russian companies. Um, So there was a whole big argument of, you know, 
you know, Haas needs to give back the, the sponsorship money that your alcohol paid them. And they went into arbitration at a Swiss court, um, which was closed out a few weeks ago at the end of June. And they were ordered to pay back a portion of the sponsorship money. But according to your Cali, they have allegedly missed their payment deadline. Haas might see a little bit more legal shenaniganery with um, their their former sponsor going into the future, but it also kind of doesn't surprise me because I think that with the way U.S. law is right now, I don't think Haas can just, as an American company, I don't think Haas can just pay them the the money owed in general. It's I complicated. Think this is just like so much red tape, and just so there's a lot going on there. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, there, there's there's a lot going on in the background. Like, you know, Haas is synonymous with legal trouble these days with, you know, Gunther, Gunther suing okay. them. They're yeah. also suing Gunther, you know, everything with with your Cali. It's 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 not it's not a great look, but it's not fun unless you're in legal trouble. Am I right? Allegedly. <laughs> Allegedly. Well, on a completely different note, someone that we've spent a lot of time talking about on this podcast is in the news again so ralph schumacher who for those of you who haven't listened to any of our episodes and don't know this he is mick schumacher's uncle and michael schumacher's brother yep yeah yes okay. so, family trees so he has come out as gay and per cnn he is the second known male f1 driver to come out as gay so the first one was mike Butler. He raced in the 70s, so I would say he's the first in modern-ish racing times to come out as gay. Yeah, to the first known one. Apparently, I, I was doing a little bit of research, and there are a couple others who were less known to to be um, probably not out, but I think there are there are a couple in the past who have come out later than life. And then Lella Lombardi, who was one of the first Formula One drivers, who was a, as a woman, um, who we talked about in our F one hundred one about women in Formula One. She um, was also gay. Um, so. You know, Ralph Schumacher may not be our favorite um, when it comes to his commentary on this sport, but good for him. Congratulations. It's it's, yes. it's good. It, it, we're happy that he is comfortable being out. Yes. Very happy for him. On another happy news note, well, depending on how you view sprint races, one has announced its 2025 sprint calendar. So let me just lay these out there for you. China. Was a sprint race this year? Repeating, fine. Miami was a sprint race, fine. Coda, why do we have two sprint races in the U.S.? I could not tell you, but thank it's been you for and fine. Brazil, love this sprint, happy about it. Qatar, okay, fine. Fine. Six, but not least, Spa. Why? It's so bad. I the, the literally the first thing that you and I said to each other when they released the the sprint calendar last week is why in why the what in the spa world is Spa sprint? doing on the sprint calendar? Like I I just like we you and you and I have discussed extensively about our issues with the sprint format. Obviously, half of the Qatar Grand Prix recap in twenty twenty three um, is about why the sprints are bad. Um, we have a full episode on trying to fix the sprint format that will be tagged above if you're watching this on YouTube. Um, but we have kind of come to this understanding and kind of figured out that sprints do better on shorter tracks. Spa is one of the longest tracks on the calendar. Why are you sprinting there? And like. What happened to the Red Bull ring in Austria? That's such a good sprint. It's a short track. Why? Yeah. Spa. I Why? have no idea. I, 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 so I, dumb. Like, the, obviously, you, you know that we are, we are less stringently opposed. Like, we don't think that sprints belong on the calendar, but the, the format that we have this season is less terrible. But I just, I, I don't, A, I don't understand spa and i don't like it and b i really am annoyed that two of the american races are sprints and also that means half of the sprints in you know in in the north south america portion of, of the you know of the world are sprints and so that you know leaves montreal and mexico and vegas as the non-sprints in north america and south america and i don't love it Yeah. Like, I get it. I get why they change it up. But Spa has absolutely no business being a sprint weekend. 
Yeah, especially like with with the weather that we always run into in spa right. that we will exactly. probably see, you know, you know, next next week. Like it's it's just it's not going to go well. Um it and like my gears how little they think about this. No, like I you, one would think that they they would have thought this through more, but like you said, like hundreds of people had to approve this. Hundreds. But it's always my thing. Something of this magnitude gets approved by a hundred people. And that means a hundred people had to be like, yes, spa is a good idea for sprints. Yeah. I want to know like what the mindset behind it was. Like who in the world thought that that was a, who, who thought that was a good idea? Now, Stefano Domenicali loves sprint races. We know that. But like who walked into Stefano's office and said, Stefano, my dude, spa should be a sprint race. Like that's even more absurd than our idea that Monaco should be a sprint race. Exactly. If you make spa a sprint, make Monaco a sprint. Yeah. Do it. I dare That you. might actually help Monaco other than, you know, making the car smaller, which we'll see in two years. Um, but I will also point out that per F1, per the F1 article, sprint live audience figures have been higher, but they, they, they pointed that out specifically to China and that the audience figures for the sprint qualifier and sprint race were up 40% in the top 15 markets compared to the two practices for the opening races. But here's my thing. Of course, numbers were higher up in China. One of the biggest markets in the world that is part of this top 15 is the Chinese market. So of course, all of China is going to tune in to watch Zhou Guan Yu. And this is the first time that China was on the calendar in five years. And it was big deal, Zhou Guan Yu, Chinese driver, et cetera. So of course, it's going to be up 40%. You can't say that it was just because of the sprint that it was better. Like you you, you can't have say that. driving backwards on the entire circuit and 40% more would have tuned in. We've been dying to go to China. You and I have talked about it a lot. We wanted to see China. Of course, it's a huge deal because Joe is there for the first time. Like, yeah, no, that's, that's a horrible statistic. Yeah. So that's like the, saying you're a hundred percent more likely to be wet when it's raining outside. Like, yeah, it, exactly. So I just, I, I, I saw that and it was like, no. And like, they, you know, the Miami numbers were up too, but everybody was watching Miami in the hopes that it was going to be, they, they were watching the Miami sprint in the hopes that it was going to be better than the regular Miami race weekend that we had in 2023. So yeah, there were going to be more people involved and, you know, everyone wants to see the hype and the ridiculous and the spectacle, especially since more and more people don't want to go to Miami because it's actually very expensive and they might as well just watch it on TV. So like, you know, saying that sprints are making these numbers better is like, maybe a fraction of what is actually better about, you know, these specific races that we've sprinted at so far. Right. And obviously and we Miami don't have the numbers a, for Austria yet. Right. Miami's a hard one too, though, because I think Miami is one of those races where it's actually on ABC in the U S not just ESPN. So it's getting to more people in the U S. Right. Cause US ABC is free to air. Right. Exactly. And so Thank you for clarifying that. And we are one of that t one of the top 15 markets. So, of course Miami's going to be up. I don't know. It's and if, you know, it, you know how us Americans are. It's like, "Oh, what's happening here? I should pay attention." But if it's at a Yeah, it's it's time it's one at of those o'clock in the morning, I'm not tuning in. So. Exactly. It's it's one of those like don't let the facts get in the way of a good story type of things, which is something that my former boss says all the time. But, like, don't shoehorn facts that make sprints look good when sprints are just annoying. They're trying to create a storyline here. They're trying to say sprints are successful. <laughs> and they're throwing yeah, every but the, the, the fact at it. So Yeah, the, the, the answer is stop trying to make fetch happen because we don't need it. Uh, well, speaking of fetch. <laughs> look at that transition. There we go. <laughs> we so did not plan we, that. No, we did not. That is just my, my quick thinking here. Um. But our future Ferrari teammates, look at that too. Look how good I am. You can tell I haven't slept much. Um, so our future Ferrari teammates met this week. Not the people, but the doggos. Roscoe and Leo, who are the dogs of Lewis Hamilton and Charles Leclerc, had a very, very, very cute meet and greet. And I'm pretty sure I watched every piece of content multiple times. Um, for those of you who don't know, Rothko is a huge um, bulldog. bulldog, and Leo is like a cute little wiener dog, so, so tiny, and he's a puppy, and that's Charlotte Leclerc's dog, and they were so cute running after balls and chasing and playing and pouncing, and it warmed my heart. I loved it. 
it was it was very very cute um but my question following this is when are roscoe and leo um going to meet simba who is pierre gasly's new dog i know right i would i would expect that leo and simba have met especially because Gasly and Leclerc were at Taylor Swift and Milan together, so I'm assuming yes. that the dogs met. We just haven't seen Instagram evidence of it yet. They haven't been allowed to release it on social media yet because it has to be it has to play in in the marketing strategy for the people who manage their social media accounts. Like it honestly would not surprise me if that was a thing because you know obviously they did that with with Roscoe and Leo, which is you know the we if if there's one thing we know about formula one social media is that the people who run the formula one social media accounts and who help the drivers manage their accounts they know what we want to see and they're really good at crafting those narratives and storylines if like look at um you know oscar piastri being adopted by half the grid like all of these things like oscar piastri leclerc was a knock out of the park social media moment so good i still think i don't think anyone can beat it this year i don't think so either top moment yeah exactly so one of these days we'll actually have to compile our top moments of the 2024 season because right now we have just have a blank document, but a lot of things have happened and we'll just, we'll, we'll figure that out eventually. Okay. Um, Maybe we but, can take some time during the summer break to get our thoughts on paper. We can, we can Maybe. try. Um, we, we, we'll see what the summer break gives us. Yes. Well, moving away from news of the week into more of race weekend, um, something that, again, we love, and we do need to do better about ranking our favorite alternative helmets, but we have yes. some alternative helmets this weekend. So Esteban Ocon and Lando Norris both have alternate helmets. There might be more. We're recording this as of Wednesday night. Those are the only ones that we've saw, that we've seen so far. Um, I'm obsessed with both of them. So Esteban Ocon's helmet mirrors his 2021 Hungarian Grand Prix winning trophy, which I think is really, really cool, paying homage to that. And then Lando Norris's was created in partnership with the people who make the Hungarian Grand Prix trophy. So here in Porcelain, they make the trophy, which he so epically and iconically destroyed last year um, yep. when he did his big Lando champagne pop. Max's trophy fell and it shattered a little bit um so i think it's really cool and a smart partnership there for them to do it i love the blue swirly floral design i think it's really really well done i think it's really really cool yeah i agree so akon's helmet is very much like a reproduction of the trophy design whereas lando's is more of that like typical designs that you would see on porcelain um that you know mirrors the trophy a lot less and and you know is, is a little bit more in line with you know lando's partnership with monster um the energy drink i really i love them both they're just they're a pair of really like but this is what we want out of our alternative helmets like these two right here no i completely agree i love i love a white helmet too i think it just sticks Mm -hmm. out really well but these are the you know thoughtful partnerships the thoughtful design that we like to see because sometimes they'll be like here's an alternative helmet and instead of bright purple I'm bright green and it's like cool yeah. there's nothing I don't want to see your logo I want to see thought put into this um so I really like these I think these are very very well done and you know very representative to the race specifically so mm-hmm. you know what? I approve Emily. Yeah, I also really liked how Lando, when he posted on social media and to announce it, he's like, sorry again for breaking your trophy last year. <laughs> I know it was only like $45,000, but... Oh. Yeah, that's not expensive at all. That That's not <laughs> most people's, you know, salaries, you know, in the United States, if that. Yeah, that's wild. That's a yeah. really expensive trophy now that I'm sitting here thinking about it. Like, oh. Yeah, I mean, porcelain is not cheap. I've gone down those, like, business insider rabbit holes of, like, how it's made, fancy things edition, and, like, you know, there, there are episodes on, like, porcelain and, like, all those, like, fancy art stuff are, like, they're really cool, but it's like, oh, those are really expensive, and they're expensive for a reason, and this this porcelain company in Hungary is, that's one of them. Man, well, speaking of the race this weekend, do you want to play Weatherman? How's the weather looking? I yeah, I will, I will pay... I will play weather person. Um, so there is an excessive heat warning issued for basically the entire country of Hungary, um, including obviously where we're going to be racing. It's really, really hot. And it's like, like Qatar 2023 all over again. 
I mean, it, it, that that's the the first thing that I said to you was that it was you know when when we saw that the weather reports was that it you know it was going to probably be like then in Qatar, if you don't remember, was really punishing. It was really hot and really humid, um, even if it was a night race. And this is not going to be a night race. It's going to be it's going to be a lot. So on Friday, the weather is um, supposed to be around like the low 90s, um, 91 degrees Fahrenheit, 33 Celsius. Um, Saturday, it's going to be a little cooler at 89 degrees um, or 32 Celsius. And then Sunday, it's going to be the hottest day of the weekend at 92 degrees, which is 33 degrees Celsius. There's also going to be between 35% and 45% humidity, which for somebody like me who lives in a desert, um, when I'm not running a summer camp, that's a lot of humidity. My hair, as you can see, is I'm somewhere with high humidity is not handling it very well. Um, and so, you know, we remember the number of drivers. Logan Sargent had to retire because he was sick. Alex Albon needed help getting out of the car. Lance Stroll passed out, like, in the medical building. Like, it was a very punishing race on these drivers and I, in, in Qatar. And I think that we're going to see that again um, this weekend in Hungary. Oh, I mean, again, to put this into perspective, like, that's how hot it is outside. But then you put your ass in a car with an engine right up against you it gets really hot even when it's not this hot out and it's a cooler race those drivers come out just sweating because the car is so hot and the track heats up and the track is really hot so you can easily add 10 15 degrees plus the humidity to these actual temperatures and that's like a baseline that's not even as hot as it actually gets so if you're like oh it's only 91 degrees like meh but no it, it's so much hotter that's it's almost like dangerous how hot it's gonna be yeah, no, you, that just reminded me one of the other issues was Fernando Alonso was complaining about, you know, getting burns right, on his back, yeah. um, you know, because he was, like you said, sitting on that engine. It's like when you think about, um, you know, watching an American football game in August in some parts of the country, like, you know, I mean, I used to live in Alabama, so that's the one that comes off the top of my head, like the humidity in Alabama and like the temperatures, if you're just in the stand versus when you're on the field, which is going to be between, you know, 20 and 30 degrees warmer, like that's, that's a lot. And that's, yeah. You know, the drivers already like lose enough weight as it is Um, when they get out of the cars after these races, they only have so much weight that they can allocate to their drinks bag, you know, drink system. There was, I think, um, Cota last year, Leclerc was without his, his drink system. Like sometimes the drink system fails and you don't have anything to drink. There was a race this year where someone's failed. I don't remember which one, but I think it was this year too. I think so too. And like there was, there was one race either last season or two seasons ago where Checo was without his, his drink system. Like it's like, it's really hard. And like, that's why the drivers, as soon as they get out of the car, they have to get weighed so that they can keep track of how much weight these guys are losing, you know, so that they're not losing too much, like a dangerous amount of weight doing this very punishing task of driving a very expensive, very fast car, 300 something kilometers. Wild. I mean, I would love to jump in an F1 car and lose, like, five kilos in an hour and a half, but. I mean, I'm sure there are other similarly less safe ways to lose five (laughs) kilos in an hour and a half, Um, but. (laughs) Yeah, it's, 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 it's going to be really rough. And I think this could be a race of it. It's going to be a scorcher. And I think it could be a little bit of a race of attrition. I, I, it would not surprise me if we have another like Logan Sargent situation of the driver getting, you know, so sick and dehydrated that they have to retire, you know, outside of whatever may or may not be wrong. I completely agree. I was just going to say that it wouldn't surprise me if we have, I would even say multiple retirees because of the weather, the heat. Yeah. And I, I think you, to exacerbate this, you know, this will be during the day. This is going to be like the middle afternoon. Yeah. It's going to be brutal. Yeah. That said, there has been flooding at the track like these last couple of days. So I think that the weather is also going to make a rapid turnaround. We're not expecting any rain issues and or any drainage issues like you know, what canceled Emilia Romagna last year um, in, in, in Imola, just because like there were drastic flooding in the region. But I, it, this is going to be a really challenging race for these drivers. Well, we will see how it goes. Let's round out the episode and get into our predictions for the 2024 Hungary. Hung- Hungarian Grand Prix. I want to say Hungoro Ring because that's what it's called, but it's Hungarian words. Yes. Words. Words. So hard. So jumping into predictions for this weekend, Catherine, who is your poll getter for the race? Um, let's see. I I went with Lando this this race. I, I I I you know 
you know, McLaren being the way they are right now, I, you know, I know that Red Bull is bringing in an upgrade package, um, but I'm, I'm going to go with Lando this time. Love. Mostly because I think that's great. And also because we don't have the same poll. So I have Max. Ooh. Interesting. I, okay. I see your McLaren and I raise you a Red Bull upgrade. So, okay. But for podium, that's not necessarily true. So for podium, I do have Lando Max Lewis. All right. I have Max Lando George. Why are you giving George credit? I mean, I thought about... always be a point of contention. It's probably because you can't give it to Lewis, right? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Like, I I thought about it, but, like, you know, I think just by and large, like, I I honestly, I honestly think that, you know, Lewis's win was a little bit of a fluke and a little bit of, like, you know, the the, the power of Silverstone just wants it, wanted its king back. Um, But, yeah, I I was, I was just going to give it to George. Blah, 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 blah. Blah, 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 blah. blah. (laughs) I don't like Lurish. Um, okay, that's fair. Yeah. Moving on. Um, <laughs> our, I don't even know why I give you so much shit for not liking Lewis, because I don't like, like, half the grid. Right? I, like, I like how, fully. I love how passionate you are about your hatred. Well, I, I, am, I am known, you know, when I'm not podcasting as somebody who, like, definitely takes a stand against things that they don't like. And I, I, I do maintain grudges out of spite, which I do get from my grandmother. Um, so that is, that is definitely very in on brand for me. <laughs> Love it. I'm here for it. Um, okay. So our last real prediction that we give ourselves points for, cause we are keeping track this season, but it has been harder than I was anticipating um, is P10. So we choose P10. P10 is the last spot. On the grid where you get points for your finish, you get one point for P10. Catherine, who is your P10? Um, This was hard for me, especially coming off actually nailing it last race at Silverstone with Yuki. Um, But I think I'm going to go with Fernando. I, I'm I'm, hope, I'm hoping that Aston Martin kind of bounces back a little bit. I was back and forth between who I picked and um, Fernando, which I think is so sad because we were still picking Fernando to be on the podium last year. Now, I know. Like, maybe he'll get a point. Um, coming out of left field, I have Checo. Interesting. I know. Okay. So I'm only giving him enough credit to get one point. <laughs> That's where my grudge yeah. still lies. <laughs> that is definitely fully where your grudge just <laughs> likes to chill. Um, which if, if we want to move into biggest surprise, my biggest surprise is that Checo has a good weekend with these upgrades that Red Bull is bringing. Cause apparently they're bringing like a massive package. And I, I'm saying that he will be in the points, so points plural. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. See, for me, if Checo has a good weekend, he doesn't That's just one DNF, point. and he gets one point. So <laughs> yes. We should honestly keep track of how many episodes I can sneak double DNF into there. I think it's like almost every racing episode. <laughs> Probably. Um, okay, and then I, for my biggest surprise, I don't know if we can still call it a surprise, but to me it is just because of how god awful they started the season i'm gonna say double points for alpine okay they've done it twice before so maybe it won't be a surprise to everybody but like i never expect them to be in the points you know what i mean well especially because you always forget that pierre gasly exists i just forget alpine's a team sometimes also that yes so okay so that's usually my you know dumb of every weekend is like oh yeah alpine um but for this weekend who do you have doing a dumb um i'm gonna stick with the dumb of ferrari they're bringing a revised floor on their car this week and probably a couple other upgrades but i i i'm i'm gonna be in the camp of i don't think it's going to help and i think ferrari is going to continue to struggle yeah i i have um the same thing i have (laughs) i have just ferrari with lots of eyes um, but basically that their their upgrade is a downgrade and things are just not going to go well. So all yeah. I can say about Ferrari, side note, sidebar, all I want this year is for Carlos Sainz to finish higher in the Drivers' Championship than Charles Leclerc. That's all I yeah. want. All I want for Christmas is for Carlos to beat Charles. Well, he's only four points behind right now. Um, he, he has 146 to Leclerc's 150. Um, he's down by so- four. And he missed a race and he lost his appendix. So it's really not bad in the grand scheme of things when you put it that way. Um, really but 
yeah, the, the battle for these these top four positions is going to be really tight, really tight going down the, the stretch, obviously. Like last year. And everyone no. thought Max was ruining F1. And I say engineering is saving it. Yeah. Yeah. We've all, are also already established in our first From the DMs episode of why Max isn't ruining Formula One, even though he's very dominant, because that's just endemic of the sport. He just pushes everyone to be better. So actually, he's exactly. helping F1. Exactly. Max Verstappen. Also, if you're keeping track with us, which I don't know how you would because I can't even figure it out. Catherine has to do it for us with her fancy spreadsheet. Our standings for the first half of 2024 uh, predictions. Catherine has 23 points. I have 14. I might be behind now, but one weekend is all I need to get back up there. So go team. Yeah. I mean, I will only say that the only reason why we have this now is because I promised after Silverstone because I realized just how far behind we were in the spreadsheet that was supposed to keep track. Um, so I, I took an evening sometime last week and I finally updated it and made sure that all the points were correct. So so yeah, so so now we know where we are. But this is like, you know, wh- you know wh- what is this? This is a touchdown plus a field goal gets you ahead of me in the points if we want to put this in, in football <laughs> terms. So like it's, it's really, it's, it's really only two a two possession, possession game. Game. There's a two possession difference. <laughs> yes. <laughs> How many sports references can we throw into our F1 podcast? All of them. <laughs> All of the references. Um, oh, speaking of sports, have you watched the Simone Biles Netflix episodes? No, There's it's on my two. list. It's a series and it's only two episodes. It'll take you like three hours. Really good. Highly recommend. But yeah. also, I'm so excited for the Olympics completely off track Catherine and I love gymnastics and we watch it and we dm each other whenever we watch them and I'm usually on a delay and so again it doesn't make sense but now I can actually watch it live and the olympics are coming up and I'm very excited go gymnastics okay back on yeah, track it's very final exciting thoughts for hungry. <laughs> final thoughts for hungry I'm very excited I feel like I've been so removed from racing because I've just been able to like watch snippets and highlights for the last two races because I was on my last adventure in south america so it feels to me like i've been on summer break so i'm very excited to have another race and i i do like the hungara ring but it's it's also just hungry but i don't know i'm excited i think it's gonna be a good yeah i'm I'm excited too we we forgot to acknowledge this in um our, our last episode from the dms um episode four but this is around the time of our podcast birthday and we didn't start with like race you know race reaction and and race predictions episode until august after the summer break but like as a, of last week we did have our very first like the it was the anniversary of our first episode um so it's wild to see that it's it's been a year i remember covering hungry on social media last summer from camp um and it's it's cool that we're we're coming you know kind of full circle and it's still really fun to do this but also i'm really excited for another year of coverage of hungry um and i think this is going to be a really exciting race weekend and i think that it's going to be a very challenging race which will make it really fun to watch for us yes Agreed on all accounts. Yeah, it's, I mean, Catherine and I had this idea to do this podcast, like kind of almost jokingly of like, we should do it. Ha ha. But actually let's do it. And then we like bottle, I had to like order stuff and time it out right when I was coming back to the US so so I could have podcasting equipment. Um, And it really just worked out. And I'm so glad we did it. I have so much fun doing this. And Catherine, you make it so easy to do this. Like we have so much fun together and you put in so much effort because I, work so much on my real full-time job um which is unfortunate sometimes but it's been so much fun doing this and I can't believe we've already been doing it for a year it doesn't feel like we've been doing it for a year no it really doesn't and then you know thinking back our first episode we recorded which was about Danny Ricardo replacing Nick DeVries um like we were recording that I was on a mountain and we had a power outage at camp. So I was using my hotspot. The lights kept flickering on and off in my room. Um, and we were just like, you know what? Screw it. We're, we're going to, we're going to record a podcast. And, we've and come we, so far. we've come so far. <laughs> we, we have actual equipment now um, and we're, we're kind of semi-functioning. So it's, it's, it's been a lot of fun and I cannot wait to see where the next year takes us, especially as we go through our first full season. I know we need to do a, a not a live episode, but we need to record together at some point. And I know we keep talking about this but we will yes. have it at home eventually yes so. we we will figure you know I, I i have some connections that will make it a little easier for me to get to texas if we need to do that and you could also come out to arizona we'll figure it out once i'm back from camp we will yeah once you're back from camp it is game over Hold our on. first episode in person is gonna be 
one, I think we'll talk really, really fast, which we'll have to focus on. And two, the banter is just going to be so much better because we have zero delay regardless of yeah. what our internet is. So, well, I'm looking forward to that. Um, but with those final thoughts on the weekend and also our first year anniversary, Catherine, what is your F1 fun fact for us today? So our F1 fun fact is about um, everybody's favorite soon-to-be former Alpine driver. But as we know this week, Esteban Ocon was given his race-winning car from Hungary in 2021. And I did a little bit of looking. And Ocon is the only non-Red Bull, Mercedes, or Ferrari winner in Hungary since 2013. Um, And he's the first Renault winner, if we want to be technical, since Fernando Alonso in uh, 2003. Um, So now that race winning vehicle, the um, A521, um, will be going from a garage in Enstone to a garage somewhere in France. Um, And I I believe that that um, Esteban is having it hang out with, um, with his family in their home in France. It's really, really cool that like, he's getting, you know, the actual car that he won the race in. Yeah. Well, and I, I was reading like a, an interview, an article or whatever about it. And he's like, it's, you know, at some point in my career, like my family had to like sell our house to help finance my career Mm -hmm. and we, you know, everything. And now I am bringing that career back into the home of like, I'm bringing back my car that it's coming full circle. So, which I always think is cool. I think it's a person. He just like, is not my favorite. Yeah, and it's, it really underscores just how challenging it is to be successful in the upper echelons of motorsport, especially if you don't have massive financial backing. Like if you look at Danny Ricardo, who had to leave Australia to find success, um, Sergio Perez came with a lot of um, support from Mexican telecom companies, which is why he's such a valuable driver, along with you know his skill when he's not forgetting how to drive. Um, but he also had to leave, you know, Mexico and, and, you know, drive in Europe. Like you have to, you know, you have to sacrifice a lot. You look at, you know, what Max Verstappen has gone through, you know, being trained by Jos Verstappen, you know, enough said, parenting. if you know, <laughs> which is, you know, another question of parenting. You're right. Um, but it's, it's really, it really underscores just how much there, you know, you have to sacrifice and that family sacrifice in order to, you know, be the part of the 1% that succeeds at the highest level of sports um, yeah. that, you know, in, in drivers like Esteban Ocon. So it is totally really cool and a total full circle moment to be like, you know, here's the car I want in. And then three years later, wheeling that into a, you know, their personal home garage. Yeah, it's very, very cool. And I think it's a nice parting gift for him as well because he's not coming back to the team. So I think it's very classy on Alpine's part. Yep, exactly. I agree. It's nice. Well, it's always nice to end the episode on a happy note. (laughs) So great F1 fun fact for us there. Um, Looking forward. So up next, we will have our Hungarian Grand Prix reaction episode out on monday make sure this weekend you follow us on all of our socials so you can see everything that's going on if there are announcements about s1 Akon or if there are more helmets we will 100 percent post on stories on our instagram but that has been our hungarian grand prix prediction episode thanks for going up check with us guys